I'll just, but it's only one audio file, so that's fine. Michelle Bartlett, you're doing a program director. I think so. She's going to do a program director. She's going to do a program director. And then I will introduce you. Okay. Thanks for the volumes. Peter, I'm Michelle Bartlett. Nice to meet you. Thank you. You're not only doing this, you're doing Gretchen Batches to do the one for the next week. Next week. On Monday. So I'm, inter I'm starting both. Different talks. So it's like the same topic. Different talks. Same picture, different yes. topics. Exactly. This is good. Yes. This is very good. No, but I don't know how, how your arm got twisted, but whatever it is, we're very, very so grateful. As, as I say, it's, it's part of why we're here at the university as a faculty member. And I'm supposed to do a service to the university. It's part of my work. Right? So I see this as just part of my service back to the community. And we're going to send you a thank you note for putting it in your file. Okay, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that would be, you know, we, we do it, we do it on a faculty report, but it's always nice to have one in your file. Yes. yes. I'm just saying, happy, happy to do this. I do it with the, the Alaska Summer Research Academy in July, where I present a bit of science to the younger generation. So I can do it to all generations. No, but I'm, I'm originally from this state. But I, I worked in London for two and a half years. But I'm from the coast myself. I'm a, I'm a beach boy. Which, uh, yeah, right. right, right, right. <laughs> British, I can tell by your tan. A British version. I can tell you, you're a real surfer, right? I've lived here in a half years. I've got the Alaska tan. Yeah. <laughs> I blend into the wall. You do, you do, you know. Yeah, it's just... Pale, yeah, the pale. Pale but yeah, I, I grew Where up by the coast, uh, southwest in so in Devon, which is southwest of Bristol. So it's a coastal environment, but it's not really a surf environment because it's just rock. It was too rocky, and the, the water's cold. Are you dying there? I was just a swimmer. So enjoy the summer, enjoy the beach, and then did soccer most of the year. I mean, just enjoyed having a. I could walk to the beach in 10 minutes. So I took a break from my exams at school, walked to the beach, wander on the beach, and then walk back and miss it. Is your mum still there? Mum's still there. So you go back and visit? Every alternate Christmas and for big celebrations like birth big birthdays and Christmas. Excellent. Does she come? She's been twice. It hasn't been <coughs> since 2010. Um, but then I've been going back more often since then. And she's been to places like China and <laughs> Africa <laughs> instead. Do I want to go to Alaska yeah. or China? Yeah. Alaska. Well, she's joined a, a um, hiking club, a walking club. Awesome. So they, they, that's the cost of that. Um, and that's why she's as healthy as she is? Yes, yeah, she's 64. And oh, she's she, a cute young thing. And she walks two 10 kilometers. We've got a group that's going to Greece mm -hmm. in October, mm -hmm. and we tell them it's an experiment and they have to be able to walk three miles a day. So if you're most interested in going to Greece... Well, she's actually planning a trip to Spain in the fall for her walking. So she goes over there beforehand, plans it all with a group of them, and they take over like 30 people. Oh, with their walking club? With their walking club. So she goes ahead of time and plans the route. Sounds very organized. Yeah, she's the secretary. Or I should say, she's an ex-accountant who's the secretary. An ex-accountant. <laughs> so therefore, she does all the numbers for them. Which is awesome. Yeah. Which is awesome. Well, this is. We usually get anywhere between. We've been as small as a dozen, mm -hmm. and we've had as many as a hundred. So this is sort of like middle size. Last night they had a dozen people actually showed up and learned about breast cancer. 32. Mm -hmm. You're a numbers person too. Right? Yeah. I was I counted two. Oh, okay. I started with five and then two. Three, four, six, eight. We aim it at everybody. Mm -hmm. but we also target the um, committee. Yeah. Sorry. Did you uh, mention about doing your first presentation for Magical Anything you like to Okay. Yep. Yeah. Good evening. I'm Michelle Bartlett. 
most of you know me. I know you for years. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be working at summer sessions at the university. And I was just trying to think, how long have we been doing Discover Alaska lecture series in, in the summer? Does anybody remember how far back we go? It's got to be at least seven or eight years. And every year we have this amazing group of people that come and we get to see Alaska through their eyes, whether they're scientists or they're artists, you know, whatever they do, we get to share it. And most of you are Alaskans. Do we have any non-Alaskans in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> do we have any visitors in the audience? No? An Alaskan? Um, those of us who have been around, Marla's have who have been around here for a long, long time. I just, because one of the reasons I asked is we get the, the information to the hotels, the Kentucky Visitors Bureau, so we're hoping that the visitors come, we'll take advantage of it. Okay? So this year, we have been partnered with the Geophysical Institute, as we have in the last couple of years, and they've come up with an incredible array. Every Wednesday night you come, and you can enjoy what's going on. And for those of you who have friends who are out watering their gardens and really wanted to be here, we are going to be, this is hoping is being taped, and we're going to be putting it up as a YouTube video. Okay, so you go back to it. Next week, you come to the summer session site um, at uaf.edu forward slash summer, and it'll be there and it'll be posted. But we're really delighted. This summer, we have 47 different events that we're offering. Okay? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Monday night is um, Magical Mondays with uh, hands on science things for parents, grandparents, and kids up in the Riker building. Tuesday night, Healthy Living series that we're doing with um, the hospital and part of extension and come up with the money so that we can do it, we can do it alone. But Wednesday night is Discover Alaska, which we couldn't do without the Geophysical Institute. And Thursday night is Music from the Garden. Tomorrow night, join us in the Georgeson Botanical Garden, live music. Uh, bring a blanket, bring a chair, sit back, look at the Alaska Range and hear live music. Okay, Red Hackle Band is opening it, and that's always a favorite. And actually, in the middle of it, Ari Hest, who's going to be um, doing a concert at the concert hall in, uh, on Friday night at 7 o'clock, will be there for just a tease, a taste of what you could expect on Friday night. So we hope, if you don't have tickets, we've got tickets for sale. There, were, there are only two events that we're selling this summer. The rest of the summer, it's all free. And so we hope you can join us for everything. If you would like to get a weekly preview of what's happening the coming week, you give your Janice. Janice Cavender, a wonderful student, although she's a retired major from the Air Force, and we're very lucky to have her. Um, when you leave tonight, she can sell you a ticket or she can take your email address and we'll be glad to on a weekly basis. So we won't spam you. If you don't want it, don't give us your email. But if you'd like to have it so you have a calendar, we, we encourage you to do that. Um, it's a really going to be a wonderful summer. I'm so glad that so many of you have chosen to join us. And without further ado, I'm going to, you know, Janice is going to take over and introduce our speaker for tonight. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Michelle. I'm going to test out the mic. Good evening. It's so nice to see so many happy faces in the audience. Tonight, we're here to enjoy our weekly Discover Alaska lecture series. It happens every Wednesday night, all summer long. Tonight, we're very honored to have Dr. Peter Webley, a research assistant professor at the UAF Geophysical Institute, here to talk about volcano activity detection in Alaska. Dr. Webley received his PhD at the United Kingdom sorry, in the United Kingdom in 2003, and came to Alaska in December of 2005. He is the chair for the World Organization of Volcano Observatories for the Americas and the Caribbean. Dr. Webley's research interests include volcanic ash cloud modeling, detection of ash clouds in thermal infrared, reverse absorption data, real-time monitoring of volcanic activity and remote sensing of volcanic processes. He'll be willing to take questions throughout the lecture, so feel free to raise your hand. 
And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Webley. Well, thank you very much for that um, introduction. Um, a long and uh, uh, career here living in Alaska. And what I'm going to talk about today has an Alaska focus, but also talks about how we can learn from other volcanoes around the world. Um, most of you live in Alaska or um, have been here for a while and know how remote Alaska is. Um, and we can't always get to those volcanoes at all, at all times. So we try and visit other volcanoes to better understand the Alaska ones. Ones that don't take us two days to get to with a boat, a plane, a train, um, maybe a mirror dinghy, maybe your friend's uh, fishing boat. Um, it's sometimes easier to get to Europe. Um, sometimes. So, what I'm going to sort of give an overview of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, why do we do this for real time? Why not wait until we can go to a volcano and then look at it? Um, and then, in the state of Alaska, we're very fortunate to have both what's known as a volcano observatory and what's known as an advisory centre. Um, and I'll go through the difference between an observatory and an advisory centre. And then, what tools do we have to actually monitor and analyse these volcanoes? Um, some example eruptions, Alaska and the globe. Um, some real-time events, those that have happened actually in the last week, um, even this weekend, even yesterday, and actually today as well. Um, some of the new tools, some of the tools that we're making use of that you might not think for monitoring volcanoes, and where do I see, my personal opinion, see us going, not the opinion of the Institute or the University of Alaska Fairbanks, it's my personal opinion. So, why do we do what we do? Why do we need to be aware of volcanoes? Well, in Alaska, it goes back many, many, many years, but the most famous um, encounter between the um, population, aviation industry, and an ash cloud was in 1989. Uh, this is the uh, KLM aircraft that was flying into Anchorage Airport in December 1989. Uh, what you're seeing at the moment on the screen is a Google Earth representation where it's easier to visualize than trying to show you a two-dimensional map. Um, but you can see the aircraft and um, in the background, the ash cloud. So here is the ash cloud, and this is the aircraft um, coming into Anchorage Airport. And what I'm going to play for you is the voice box recording from the co-pilot and from the ground control. Um, and then also I'll pick out some of the pieces of text from within that voice recording. So because of potential feedback with this microphone system and the speakers, I'm going to put the microphone up to the laptop. So, um, the reason we play it is everybody was safe. We wouldn't play it unless, if, if there had been a disaster. There's been no aviation loss um, to do with volcanic ash clouds. However, as you can see from the text on the screen, they had flame out of all of their engines. This was 1989, so aircrafts then had two engines on either side. So they lost all four. And in the end, about a kilometer, so 3,000 feet above the mountains, they got two of the engines started. Uh, the co-pilot was the lady that you heard talking to the air traffic controller. The captain was on his sleep mode because they were going from Schiphol in Amsterdam to Anchorage, change over Anchorage to Tokyo. 
Uh, they didn't fly the whole route in one go. So the co-pilot was landing, captain was asleep, and then he would take off and start off the next part of the journey. Um, so she was the one basically controlling the descent, and he was the one starting the engines. And they got two engines restarted, and they landed at Anchorage Airport. In 1989, the total cost of the eruption to the economy was about $160 million at that time. Half of that was refitting this aircraft. It cost about $80 million, and they were in the ash for five minutes. Um, and I'll come to another example um, more recently in Indonesia, where they even had a multi-million dollar potential loss and they didn't even have a disaster, they just clipped the edge of the cloud. So, aviation and ash clouds are uh, two things that don't like to mix. Um, the other one, the big example from Europe, um, this is Air Fjallo Jokul. It's taken me four years to pronounce that, so please don't try. The big E is one they call E14 or E15. Um, what you're seeing is a video footage of um, aircraft flights, and you're now seeing the, light, the flights coming back. This is over four days in Europe, so now this is sort of normal. So you can see the different locations, you can see those in Europe, you can see Paris in here, um, Amsterdam, London, uh, Liverpool, Manchester. And uh, by about the 20th or the 21st, the very end of the video, that's what it's normally like in Europe. They close European airspace down for five days. Um, biggest um, closure of European airspace since the Second World War. Um, because of an eruption in Iceland, which is actually off the map, it's way up here. It's about a three hour flight from London uh, to um, Iceland. So this is like an eruption in Alaska closing the airspace in Washington, Oregon, California, um, the Dakotas, Texas, I'm testing my American knowledge of the states here. <laughs> um, Texas covers a large, very large area, Arizona, uh, even probably as far as Louisiana, maybe into the Carolinas. Um, this caused five billion, billion dollars worth of loss during the next days to the European economy. No aircraft were in anywhere near the ash clouds. They made the decision of a blanket ban. Probably the right thing to do, for safety reasons. So I was there, I was stuck. Um, so these are locations in Poland. So Poland and Hungary, and this part of Eastern Europe that were being delayed because of an eruption in Iceland. That's like Alaska impacting San Antonio, an eruption. So this was a major event. This is why we need to be aware of what's happening at these volcanoes to best advise what the aviation community can do. Then there is um, an eruption in Indonesia where a Jetstar Asia aircraft flew through an ash cloud and had $20 million worth of damage to its two engines, and that's one engine on either side of its aircraft, flying from Perth into um, Jakarta and uh, had to stop the flights in Jakarta, couldn't fly onto Singapore, um, and it said airborne ash is the, is the cause that they're going to have to put two brand new engines on their aircraft. Um, if this happened twice, a company of this size would go bankrupt. $40 million is probably their buffer zone for their daily allowance of monies. So, so these are severe events, and this is its route, and this is the route actually took. Uh, this is its normal route coming across into Indonesia, so this Australia is the southern part of here. And it actually took a very uh, sharp southwesterly turn to get away from the ash cloud. Um, this is what actually was occurring at the time. Um, these are satellite images, and I'll go into these later. This is a visible image, so this is what you would have seen if you were on a spacecraft looking down onto the planet. This is a thermal image with the darker colours being colder temperatures, and then this is a view looking sideways on it in Google Earth, and the actual altitude of this cloud is at about 29 kilometers above sea level. So if you think of where we are now in relation to Fox, that's like going to Fox and back up. So these things don't get, get, can get very high up into the atmosphere. So obviously easily into the aviation routes. So 
In Alaska, uh, I mentioned that we have, are very fortunate to have an observatory and an advisory center in Alaska. It's the Alaska Volcano Observatory, which is a collaboration of three groups, uh, the United States Geological Survey, um, with its main offices in Anchorage, the Alaska Division of Geological and Geophysical Surveys, with its main offices down on the uh, College Road, um, and the Geophysical Institute um, here at the university. And these three groups together work to better monitor real-time the activity at um, Alaska's volcanoes. And they have um, volcano alert levels, um, both in terms of text, as you can see here, you can see here, and these can help provide advice to those dealing with uh, volcanoes and the proximity to population centers. And a color-based system. Um, here we have, um, it's sort of like, I mean, it's like a um, traffic light system, but with additional color. Um, and once you see red, you're automatically thinking of warning, you're automatically thinking of something's under eruption. Um, and I'll go a little bit into detail of the Pavlov um, activity uh, later on in, in my presentation. In terms of advisory centres, uh, these were put together in about 1988-89 around the world. Um, there's two of them that are maintained uh, by the National Weather Service in, in the United States. Um, you can see that there's some very strange lines to their defined boundary here, where the Washington Advisory Center, which sits over here, actually in Washington DC, not Washington State, um, is responsible for um, as clouds for the aviation community all the way over here in what looks like the middle of Indonesia, but actually it's the Marianas Islands. And um, the reason why it extends so far west is because the Oakland Air Traffic Control Center, that's actually part of their district zone. So any aircraft that flies in this region will be getting their advice on the ash clouds from the Washington Advisory Center and the Oakland Air Traffic Control. Um, the same here for the boundary between Anchorage and Washington is the difference between Anchorage and Oakland in terms of the air traffic control. Montreal is the um, country boundary. So these centres were set up to provide information directly to the airline community. Um, so uh, they when there's actually an event, so this is from my experience in the past from working um, as part of the observatory, I'm, I'm not now an employee of, of the um, Alaska Volcano Observatory, but I was for many years, and the observatory would detect some increased activity. Um, and then they would go out and raise the alert level, which is what happened at Pavlov on Saturday. Um, they then provide a call down process to the advisory centre. Uh, then the advisory centre will provide an advice to the aviation community. So the observatory's role is to provide advice to many people on the ground, um, and then the advisory centre will provide information to the airlines and to the airline companies. And that would go directly to maybe their um, uh, office for um, plan flight planning, um, and then it's up to the airline to decide what to do with that advice. So if it's Delta or Alaska or Pan Air, they make the decision to fly or not from that advice. Um, and then they will provide updates um, on a regular basis, it's actually every six hours, unless there's a change in activity. Uh, this is standard policy for the advisory centers, but if the volcano increases activity or stops or slows down, then a new piece of information comes out. So people are uh, advised to the best of the knowledge of the observatory and the advisory center, such that they can make the best decision themselves. So here is what a um, observatory notice looks like from the, the Volcano Observatory. It looks very detailed, but you'll notice on the left-hand side, there's numbers. And those numbers will always appear in every piece of advice. So you can automatically go to line 11 and you will be able to read the summary of the eruption. This is an older one from 2006, I didn't have the time to pull the more recent one from Pavlov, but you can pull straight away from, from each individual line the piece of information you want. If you want to know which volcano it is, you can go to line 3 and that will always be there. 
Even if there are no remarks, there will still be a blank that says remarks. It means that it's easy to read, it's easy for somebody to ingest and to be trained how to read these. All of that information will always appear. This is um, what goes to the aviation community or to the advisory centre. Again, always the same format. If I pull up the one from Pavlov from Saturday, it would look very, very similar. You have seen one now, you'll be able to now read the next one that you see because you've seen the design and how it's put up. And this means that when somebody new comes onto shift, when somebody new is part of the advisory system, they're knowing exactly what's coming. And there's been some standardization worldwide to try and take what Alaska does and make it something that is more universal globally. So if you're Delta Airlines and you're flying from Seattle to Tokyo and you're flying across Russia and there's an active volcano, what information you're getting from the Russian scientist is similar to what you would get if you were flying over the Alaskan volcanoes and there was an active volcano. Trying to standardize the system so it's easier for those in uh, air traffic or those in um, hazard assessment for, for population centers to have a standard format so they're not having to learn the new format that's coming and made available. So, in terms of what tools are available to both volcano scientists and volcanic ash advisory centre scientists, most people think of the typical monitoring tool is seismic monitoring, monitoring for earthquakes. Um, the old system used to be that big drum with a needle that moves backwards and forwards and big pieces of paper that people would take out and look with a pen and try and work out what's going on. Well, it's got a little bit more complicated than that since the, the drums still, still are there. But what you see now is this is computer space. Left to right is 30 minutes. Top to bottom is 24 hours. So if you think of the old drum paper and cut it into 30 minute intervals and stick them together with a piece of sellotape to make it 24 hours, that's the computer version. It allows us and it allows the observatory to automatically pick out earthquakes automatically look for changes without having to have somebody 24 hours a day walk up to the drum and measure them. Um, also it doesn't run out of ink or paper, uh, which is kind of nice when volcanoes don't wait for you to wake up in the morning. Volcano eruptions never happen at 9am. They never happen once you've had your coffee. They never wait until the summer. Uh, volcanic events generally happen about 2am, about December the 30th, uh, when it's about 40 below. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience, and it's not fun having to get out of bed, put on your pyjamas or put on your clothes, make sure your car's plugged in. If your car's not plugged in, you, you're a bit uh, lost. Um, sometimes you might have a 20 minute drive into, into the university just to look at the data, um, and you can't wait that long. So the tools that the observatory and others have built are also web-based, which means you can look at them on these things on the phone. Um, which means you can actually do it just from sitting in the kitchen. Um, makes it a lot easier, makes it easier to get out assessments, easier to get out information, and quickly. So that's why these, a lot of these work in huge base. Um, and you can get a lot of information out of these. You can tell what type of earthquake it is, if it's volcanic or if it's just plates moving, um, volcanic or tectonic. Um, is it a landslide? Is it a dome collapse? Is it a big explosive eruption? Is it a lava flow? They all have different signals in these data, and you can pick those out. Then there's ground deformation. Um, seismic stations are only one location point. And to get good measurement of earthquakes, you need a number of these nearby to get good location information. So there are other tools to be able to allow you to measure the larger scale motion of the volcano. There's GPS, um, again, point information, but can allow you to look at the larger scale. And then there's something called INSAR. This is a radar-based technique. And what it's doing is it's looking for the swelling and forming of a volcano. And it allows you to map the ground at one point in time, and then a few days later map it again, and you look how much the ground has changed. And this can give you centimeter accuracy over something as big as the interior of Alaska. Um, allowing you to look for very small changes in an active volcano. So that was a remote sensing technique. Um, my, my area of field is remote sensing, 
And uh, as part of volcano analysis and volcano monitoring, remote sensing really has become a very useful tool in Alaska. Uh, normally, if I present this in Europe or if I prevent, present this in the lower 48, I talk about remoteness, the size of Alaska, how much coastline we've got, how many volcanoes we've got, but I don't need to go into the exact details for everybody here because most of us know that sort of information. Um, but it allows us to see the larger picture very quickly. We're not looking at individual points, we're looking at the larger area. So this is an eruption in 2009 from Mount Redax volcano. So we've got the Anchorage area, Redax down here, um, just, just to the west of the peninsula on the mainland. And we can display these sort of things in Google Earth. This makes it easier to understand what's going on. Um, from this map, I can draw now the edge of where the cloud is. I don't have to load on the airports that are already loaded in, coastlines, uh, roads, and for anything like um, hazard assessment, then things like hospitals, areas that could be impacted by ash. This information could then be passed on to maybe a FEMA organization or something like that for them to make their own assessment based on this sort of data. Um, and we also do modeling um, because we want to know what's going to happen in the future. A volcano goes off, but we want to know, is it going to impact Fairbanks? Um, could an eruption in the Aleutians put ash in and around Fairbanks? We don't want to wait for it to happen. <laughs> we want to know 24 hours in advance to then determine, is there going to be a health issue? Is there going to be a PM 2.5, PM 10 breach because of a volcano coming over? Um, and I'll go a little bit into well, how that can be done for forest fires as well, given that funny river fire that has been happening in the last couple of weeks. Um, and then again, you can display these on a Google Earth overlay to better understand the volcanic activity. So, remote sensing, before I go through some examples, what is remote sensing? Um, I'm doing it to you right now. I'm not sat next to you, I'm remotely sensing where you're sat. That camera is doing it. A camera is taking a picture every 14 seconds of thermal information. So for this presentation, there will be a picture every 14 seconds of the heat from this room um, to see who's hot, who's cold, um, who's got poor circulation in their fingers. No. Um, but it's, it allows us to remotely analyse a volcano or a piece of something that's moving without actually having to go and stand and touch it. And when you see an active volcano up close and personal, you will realize that remote sensing of a volcano is a lot safer than testing the temperature of a volcano from a few feet away from the active feature. Um, what are some of the examples for remote sensing? Um, this is actually an example from a Stromboli volcano in Italy from last summer. Um, and although this is Discover Alaska, I show this one because it takes about 18 hours to get to this volcano in the sun. It takes about 22 hours to get to its equivalent volcano in the Aleutians, which is Mount Cleveland. Um, also, you can see our location. It's nicely situated in a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> so I've chosen, I think I've chosen a, a picture that allows me to present. Yes, I don't have any of the food that we were eating at the time, but the volcano is active in the background, and the video feed you see here is actually from one of these cameras. It's actually this camera in the room. Um, situated to point out the volcano. And by going to volcanoes like this, we can better understand what's happening at the Alaskan volcanoes that have a similar, similar style, similar type of eruptive process. And it also makes a nice field work. Um, other tools that can be used is radar um, and LIDAR, but this is really a radar image. Um, and what this is, is a pointable radar that the USGS has got that was situated down in 2009 here, just across the Cook Inlet from Redout Volcano. And with this sort of information, what you're seeing on these snapshots are one minute intervals of an erupting cloud. And you can actually do slices through the eruption cloud with this sort of data. This really helps for understanding the size of the explosion. Um, and then can be used to better predict where it's going to go, what its dispersion is going to be. Um, 
you can get total eruptive material from this, how much material is in the eruption cloud, because that's significant for forecasting ash for communities. Um, often, because you can't go and sample the volcano as it's erupting, you want to actually be able to get some form of measurement without going into the cloud. This tool could be used, can be used to do that. And then you can say, what's the possibility of a certain ash fall in a community, be it Anchorage or be it um, Kenai Peninsula. Also, webcams have now started to become part of the volcano analysis tool set. You're probably thinking, webcams, these, aren't these the things that I turn on my computer to Skype with, with my friends? Well, yes. Um, but they have an advantage. They're normally set up to detect what we think is visible, so what we see with our eyes. But actually, these cameras go further in, into what's known as the infrared. Um, so they can actually measure below what our eyes can see, which means they work at night. Um, and these webcams are not $20,000, which is what that camera is. They are $50. Um, or they're free if you go to university surplus for other locations. And they can be set up at a volcano, and I'll show some examples, for looking for ash clouds. This is a 2012 one in Cleveland. But then at night, they can look for thermal activity. They can look for eruptions from a camera that you could go and buy at Freddy's or Walmart for 50 bucks. Um, because of how they're designed, because they're designed really to look for um, intense color changes. So they're trying to capture as much light as possible to, for a best view across the web. Um, then actually they can be useful for uh, thermal volcano uh, activity. Um, here's a daytime footage. Um, on the left is the same video footage from that camera. And on the right, it's a little hard to see, but there's actually an ash cloud here being detected in this webcam. This webcam was connected to my laptop, connect, taking an image every one second, and that camera was $44. Um, and if destroyed, could be replaced for $44. If destroyed, um, half my salary, or quarter of my salary, at least. Um, and would take a long time to get. $44 camera can be picked up and put from, from, from um, local stores. Um, so this is just a visible image that you can do with these, with these um, types of webcams. Um, you can also look for volcanic gases with uh, these. This is actually a, a fairly expensive setup, but with some of these other cameras you can look for gases. And this is critical because of the amount of sulfur dioxide that volcanoes put out. Um, something like a, a um, Kilauea volcano in, in Hawaii puts out as much sulfur dioxide a year as a big explosive volcano like a Pavlov event because it's just continually putting out sulfur dioxide. And there's a lot of issues with vol uh, volcanic uh, vog in, in the Hawaii region because of that. Um, it can be converted into sulfates. Big explosion, explosion eruptions um, can actually generate cooling of the atmosphere. Uh, but these have to be, well, we're not talking about amounts of helix, we're talking about something 10 times the size of that. But they can easily cool the planet by half a degree um, because of the amount of sulfates that get up into the atmosphere. So being able to detect how much sulfur dioxide comes out can better help. So we're all talking about assessment, prediction, detection. So that what we're doing here is better understanding the volcano so we can then provide the best advice of the change in the activity. Also, um, remote sensing can be classified as airborne. Uh, here at the university, we have a, a very or high quality uh, unmanned aerial vehicle program. Um, and I believe one of the presenters in later on in this uh, series, um, AL, will be presenting on UAVs. Um, and why might you think, well, how can a UAV help us for volcanoes? Well, volcanoes are hazardous. You don't want to put a helicopter up there. You don't want to put personnel up there. A UAV, as long as it's got the right authority to fly, can fly in and around the volcano without putting any personnel at risk. Um, and it allows you then to use, I'll just do a quick snapshot of a couple of the UAVs at the university, not to steal AL's thunder, but to show you that some of these can be useful 
um, for monitoring and analyzing volcanoes. Um, and I'm actually working with AL and others on how to, how to adapt some of the university capabilities to go and actually monitor and analyze volcanoes um, using the UA, UAV program. So spaceborne is um, another area of remote sensing. So I've, I've tried to go out with each part of my presentation. I started on the ground, and now I went to the air, and now I'm up in space. And all of these names represent a sensor or a satellite. And they're all acronyms, because otherwise it makes me, it takes me like 10 minutes just to explain the name of a satellite system. Um, they're American, um, with ALI, and Hyperion, and Landsat, and goes. This side is sensors that were developed by American uh, researchers, mainly at NASA. Uh, this is also a NASA-based sensor. Severi is in Europe. This is in uh, Indonesia and uh, Pacific. Uh, this is a Dutch-based sensor. Um, American um, ALOS is Japanese. So everybody is involved in spaceborne remote sensing. And the reason why we try to do and use satellite data is because, as I said earlier, we can't get to every volcano. So this data, these data sets can really help us understand globally what's happening for the volcanoes. So I chose ASTA um, as an example, um, being an American-based system, and also because it's been up there quite a while. Uh, there's been about 14 years worth of data, and this is an image from space. Um, that you can get of an active volcano. Um, and I've got some more examples later on um, of other sensors. But you can, from this data, really understand what's going on at the volcano in one snapshot. You're not on the ground, you don't have to go anywhere near it, and you're able to see pyroclastic flows, ash and steam, based on different colouring, and you can see um, it, it the proximity to any population centres. Another example, high resolution data. This is on the meter to centimeter resolution. Um, and this allows you to really understand how the volcanic activity is changing. I've shown here an example for um, Etna in Sicily to show that the data set can be available anywhere on the globe. And this data allows you to see 100 meter long lava flows to a centimetre resolution, um, really helping you understand what's going on at the active volcano. So I'm going to show some examples, uh, one um, in uh, Russia, uh, two in Alaska, and one in uh, Chile, Hawaii um, volcano. So Torbache, uh, this was in 2012 until about uh, late last year, and this is actually from a student's research project here at the university, where you can actually, from one satellite, see different features of the volcano. So you don't have just one snapshot view, and then you wait for the next slide, next time you have another snapshot view. You can have multiple pieces of information from one satellite sensor. So the top left is the sort of naked eye, what we would see, View, and then by looking at the individual channels, you can determine which is the hottest target and then which also is um, producing a thermal signal. So by combining the channels together, you can better understand what's happening at the volcano. And that's what it's really about. All of these tools, there's multiple data sets available, remote sensing, seismic, um, GPS, deformation, the other tools I haven't even gone into, but it's all about confirmation. If five different sensors are telling you something's going on, there's probably something going on. But if one sensor tells you something's happening and the others aren't telling you anything, you sit down and go, okay, is that noise? Is that actually an error in the data? But if you start getting a message saying, this one's now going off, this one's now going off, this one's now going off, you go, okay, there's an event. And it's really making you as much use of the information available to better understand the volcano. And here is uh, two different examples. On the right-hand side is the visible view, what, our, what, what we would see. The left-hand side is thermal infrared. It's very similar to what this camera captures, but from space. And 
This is um, an active flow, and on the visible one, you can't tell which is the older or the newer flow, because you're just vis visualizing what's, what's there. But on the left-hand side, by looking at the temperature, you can see the hot material from the new features and the older flow that's still warmer than the surrounding stone. But you wouldn't have got that from a visible image. You wouldn't have got that if you flew over in a helicopter. But you would if you'd been able to fly over with a thermal camera. But as you can see from the visible image, you probably wouldn't want to be anywhere near that active flow to actually get that measurement. A satellite means you don't have to. In fact, that's all the information from space. Then there are the weather satellites. So when you watch the weather at night or, or in the morning, you get to see a view of the whole Pacific to say these are where the clouds are, low pressure system, high pressure system. Well, these same satellites we can use to track volcanic ash clouds. This is Kasatochi 2008. Uh, the reason I show this one is the scale of where the ash cloud went. So we have up here Anchorage, volcano location, and then we obviously have Seattle. Um, and this volcanic cloud put one megaton of ash into the atmosphere. Um, this is over four days. And it caused enough of an issue for aviation in Alaska, for Alaska Airlines to stay, state that the uh, state of Alaska was unflyable because it erupted and put ash into this region, which for those that fly from the lower 48 up to Alaska will know that that is the aviation route in and out of the state. Um, also, it is August, which means it is summer season, which means it is tourist season. In four days, nobody can get in and out of the state. Um, this eruption was about a thousand kilometers from Anchorage, but it generated more aviation delays than Redout Volcano, which turned into three hundred kilometers away. So um, you've always got to be aware that it may not be the volcano next to you that's the impact, it may be any volcano anywhere that could be an impact. And you've got to be prepared uh, for, for that eventuality. Uh, and then what I will do for the time is I'll show this one. This is um, a shot looking down at Antarctica. This is an eruption um, from a volcano in Chile in 2011 where the ash cloud went round the globe twice. An ash cloud in Chile delayed flights in Sydney, going west to east, not the other way. Um, and actually, when there was the volcano was erupting on about the third or the fourth of June, there was an ash cloud going west to east out of the volcano, and there was an ash cloud coming from the west to the east over the volcano from three days earlier. Um, so they had an erupting volcano at the ground level and they had an ash cloud up at about 20,000, 30,000 feet flying overhead that had circumnavigated the Indian Ocean going across, so going across South Africa, going across New Zealand, Australia, and people in Australia were saying, I'm in Sydney, I can't fly to Brisbane because of a Chilean volcano. And they're like, pardon? <laughs> so the aviation community were like, how do we deal with this? Because this is a volcano that's traveling six, seven, eight thousand kilometers and is impacting a country that doesn't even have an erupting volcano in it. And this also happened within a year of the European event, where countries like Poland were having to put together emergency plans for aviation from volcanoes. They've not had volcanoes anywhere near them for tens of thousands of years. Um, and then we had something like an Ok Mok um, eruption in 2008. This again is an example from a student project where you can use this data, this is a um, multi-angled camera where you can actually look at three-dimensional shapes of ash clouds from space. Um, and you can get ideas of plume height from space without actually having to go anywhere near the volcano. Uh, this is from uh, 2008. What are some of the real-time tools that you can get access to? What I've shown you is data I've processed and pulled offline. Uh, so for the research community, these are some of the example websites that you can go to to get the sort of data. Um, and this is where a lot of our students and our researchers go to be able to pull that data in and use it in their class projects, uh, some projects or graduate um, 
degree, degree program. But there are web-based tools that allows the research community and the hazard assessment community to get access to this data in real time without having to process it, without having to spend your night sitting there on a computer clicking a button and hoping it, hoping it processes. Um, this can be done automatically and be made available through the internet, which is really helpful for volcanic hazard assessment given that it can happen at any time of the day. At any time of the year as well. Um, here is an example of one of these uh, thermal cameras that is actually available online where with this data you can actually automatically pick out types of events and sizes of events. So it's all about automatic detection to better understand what's happening. Um, and you can use any tool, any data available, so then you're getting information as quickly as possible to the right person to make the right assessment. Here's an example, actually this is from uh, Guatemala, but this really shows the sort of data you can get. That's a webcam, it's not one of these. It's actually about, it's about probably about a hundred dollar camera. Um, the, at daytime it's a nice picture of the clouds and the, the lush greenery of Guatemala, but at night this is what you can get. And what you're seeing are individual explosive events linked up to the, what the webcam is seeing. The advantage of this is that there was a seismic station nearby. Um, but you don't always have this. You don't always have this. But if you've got one, you can better understand what's happening because sometimes you have both. So by having a webcam, that what we're seeing here is the explosive activity and it's producing so much heat that even in the camera itself, it can measure it. Even though the camera is not designed to measure it. It's producing so much heat that it's producing a signal in the camera's measurable system. And this is the similar camera that you could have outside for watching birds flying around in the garden. Because um, all they're doing is measuring heat. Um, so what I'll finish off with is I'm going to show you an example of how you can combine all these data sets together to better understand the volcano. And then to finish off, I'll talk about Pavlov and some other volcanoes around the world that have been active in the last month and show you some example imagery. So I focus on this event from Cleveland in 2009, um, not only is it in Alaska, but it also was one of these ones that really showed the need to combine data together. So this was, the this was one of the views, we had a webcam. Uh, this was fortunate because the Aleutian Islands, the Aleutian chain, pretty much never clear like that. The Aleutian Islands, generally it's cloudy. Uh, generally you might have a low level cloudy. So we were very fortunate, we had a webcam. We knew where the um, sea level was and we knew where the top of the volcano was. So we could use this information to tell us approximately the height of the ash cloud. But there's a problem with this data. It's only one two-dimensional view. We don't know if the cloud is going away from you or towards you, or if it's going straight up. Because it's just a, it's like a photograph. So if you take a picture of a weather cloud in front of you, you don't know if that cloud is coming towards you, but you do when you watch it with your eyes and it visually moves over, but the one snapshot You've no idea where it's going. So we can only approximate. So we said, well, it's maybe five kilometers above sea level from what we can see. Then we had um, the ability to detect the thermal signal from the eruption. So how much heat was being generated. And we were getting at the summit of the volcano, which is this white pixel here, was 44 degrees Celsius. Probably thinking that's not very hot. It's like a hot tap and you, then you sink. But this is 44 degrees Celsius for a one kilometer pixel. That's 44 degrees average for an area the size of the university campus. So that means it could be a feature as big as this room at a thousand degrees and the rest of the area is a standard background sort of temperature you would think of for the ground. So the average is at 44 degrees. So we had something very hot. 
To raise the temperature of an area the bigger camp size of campus to 44 degrees means something very warm and very active is at the summit of the volcano. So we had another confirmation that there was a significant event. The maths on this, this uh, slide, I normally don't show a presentation with math, so I do apologize for those that it's an evening and you're having to understand some math. But the idea of this is that this image here was able to tell us that we thought there was about half a kiloton of ash. So this number at the bottom, it's 0.48 here, is what we interpreted from that satellite image using some mathematical analysis of the data. So we said, well, it was about half a kiloton of ash. Then we had a satellite image of the ash cloud. And we did some measurements with the satellite data similar to what you saw for that Katatochi eruption, and we said 0.47. Now that probably sounds a little bit suspect that it's that close, but that was the truth. It was within 0.01 kilotons, within 100, so 100, uh, 100 tons, uh, which we thought was pretty good for a small sized event. Then we ran the dispersion model and found that what we were seeing in the satellite image as you saw here, it's going to the southeast. So we found that anything five kilometers and below was going to the southeast. So that five kilometer approximation we made from the webcam was pretty good. But we have the webcam, we have a thermal satellite image, we have an ash cloud of a satellite image, and the model that is telling us five kilometers, half a, half a kiloton of ash. So therefore we were able to say, okay, we've got four confirmations that something's going on. But you're probably wondering, where's the seismic data? Where's the earthquakes? This volcano is unusual. There is no seismic station on it. There's no seismic station for about 30 kilometers. Because it is so remote, and it's an island, it's very hard to put a seismic station on the ground and get any useful data. I've, I, I believe the observatory in the near future is working on better mapping this volcano from the ground, but it's very, 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 very hard because of its location. What else can you do with satellite data? Well, this is a volcano from April of this year. This is actually um, in Chile, and the left-hand image is visible. What you might think of you would see from space. On the right-hand side is a way to actually map out the volcanic eruptive feature, and the purple is ash. Left hand side, unless you know the area, it's pretty hard to say where's the volcano, where's the eruption plume. The right hand image is pretty obvious where the eruption cloud is. Straight away, just by doing, and all I've done here is I've combined images in a color scale. But the data is such that certain colors come up for ash based on the data, based on the temperatures it's measuring. So very quickly, I can pick out where the, where the ash cloud is. And then I can do things like overlay in a Google Earth view. So then for those that have never visited the area, they can see its proximity to population centers and, and other communities. Here's an example of what can be done with webcams. This is actually from Hawaii. This is the Hawaii Volcano Observatory's panoramic view of Pollo Crater, where they've actually got four webcams stitched together Bottom one is a daytime image, top one is a nighttime image, where you can actually see developing features from the um, active crater, crater floor. Um, and with some analysis techniques, you can detect those automatically and provide that information to the relevant organizations of a change at the volcano. Uh, I mentioned the funny river fire. Um, it produced a significant amount of heat. So Similar techniques can be used to what we do for volcanoes to monitor forest fires with these, with these data sets. Left hand side is the visible image. We can see the smoke emanating from the fire. And the right hand side is the infrared image. And then, if I zoom in, you can actually see the hot portion of the flow. This is actually early on in the event, so this is the area the event got, becomes heavily impacted. But you can see the fire edge, and this sort of information is useful for firefighters 
because it gives a larger picture of what's happening. They may not be able to see beyond the edge of the smoke, but with this sort of satellite data, you can, can and it can be made available in, in terms of incident command. Pavlov. Um, Pavlov volcano itself um, became active um, evening of Friday, and the observatory put out, put out its information on Saturday um, of what was going on. Um, bottom image is the Federal Aviation's webcam um, that's actually showing incandescence overnight, which is actual thermal activity from the summit. This webcam was placed for aviation to know for safety for flying, not for monitoring volcanoes. But it's positioned such that Pavlov volcano is in its corner and it can now monitor volcanoes. Opportunistic data available for volcano monitoring. Um, it's got a lava flow. This was on June, June 1. It was about 900 meters in size. We're looking uh, from the north, so the volcano is actually going, or looking south, so the volcano, the lava flow is going down the northwest flank, and that's what's actually generating this plume. Um, and we've got saturated data in the satellite imagery, which means it's probably in the hundreds to thousands degrees Celsius at the summit. So obviously, you would not want to go there. And then there was an eruption in another one in, uh, between May and June in uh, Indonesia, uh, Sangiai Apai volcano, and this actually caused um, airport closures to Darwin, um, Australia, so we're over here, and also so flights down in and out of Sydney. And this is what it looked like from the ground. Um, this is a um, photograph from a gentleman on one of the nearby, nearby islands. Uh, then on the bottom right is what it looked like from space on the 30th of May, uh, a fairly dispersed cloud. And you can see here the uh, main part of the eruption plume and also the material from the collapsing flood, um, pyroclastic flows on the flanks of the volcano. And I mention that because of what you're then able to see on June the 2nd. Uh, and it's actually a little easier to see. The next image, when I zoom in, is this feature here. What is this? It looks like um, sort of like a dirty material flowing in the ocean. It's actually the eruptive deposit from the volcano that's actually interacting with the ocean uh, cover. So this image that I've displayed that um, enhances the activity of the volcano actually allows you to see the um, volcanic deposits in the ocean um, and uh, this sort of level of activity can even increase phytoplankton blooms in the ocean. Um, in 2008 we found the highest bloom of phytoplankton in and around the northeast Pacific Ocean that has been recorded in 11 years about two weeks after that eruption from Katatochi that I showed you, that big ash cloud. Well, it's one megaton of ash into the atmosphere, deposits onto the ocean surface, was then able to actually make a bloom in the phytoplankton um, on, within the ocean surface that they even saw from measurements um, of ocean-going vessels that were doing experiments out there. They, they thought it was an anomaly in their data. So they were trying to, trying to understand what was going on, and they found out that actually it was the volcanic ash that was depositing wet onto the ocean surface it was actually able to produce a bloom in the phytoplankton. Um, and here we can see another example of eruptive products interacting with the ocean color. And you can see the significant, um, you can actually see where the ocean flow is. The majority of the ocean flow will be this way, uh, hence why the tongue of that material is going down to the southeast. So, to finish off, coming up just to 8 o'clock. So, the future. Um, I mentioned it briefly when I did the Cleveland example. It's all about intercomparison. It's all about making use of all the data we can. Um, be it the public, be it somebody making an observation, be it somebody calling up the observatory, calling up a friend who worked maybe in the aviation community saying, hey, have you seen that eruption at such and such a volcano? Well, don't hold on to it. Tell somebody because you may be the first person that's seen it. Um, I showed you examples of some of this, the um, equipment that's available. And uh, one of the areas that I'm working on is how to use webcams to actually detect activity, rather than just going, oh, that's a pretty picture. That's, that's a nice view of the volcano. 
You don't want to do that at 2 a.m., having to wait up, wait up and go, okay, next image is coming, is anything happened? No, next one, has anything happened? Like, no. You want to be able to look at it when it's, when it's active, not when nothing's going on. Airborne. Um, UAVs could really come into their own for this because manned flights in and around volcanoes are unsafe, they are expensive, um, and uh, a small UAV could better help understand what's going on at the active volcanoes. And with satellite data, there's going to be more available, and we're going to get better understanding and finer detail of what's going on at the volcano. So to finish off, this is an example of an eruption um, from early, I think if I remember rightly, this is from uh, 20th of May. Uh, this is actually Shevelich Volcano in Kamchatka. Um, I pulled this one up because this is an image every minute. Um, and this went to about uh, 30,000 feet above sea level, the height of the cloud. Um, produced um, a ash cloud that was probably on the range of several hundred kilometers um, and impacted some aviation routes going across into um, Asia from, from the United States. Um, but this is the sort of data that you could get from a webcam if you get the data frequently enough. This is every minute. If you had an image every 10 minutes, you may miss it. But it's all about the frequency of the data. And this is, as you can see, when there's nothing going on, it's just a nice webcam that someone has at. Actually, I think this probably is at somebody's property. Uh, I don't think this is actually at a volcano observatory building. Um, and another camera looking at this volcano from a different direction can actually see the growing dome, the thermal heat from the dome, and, you can, and if you capture it often enough, you can actually see the pulses of the surface of the dome as it breaks. You get this hot target and then cold, and then hot target and then cold. So um, that's where I see us going, is making use of things we may never have thought of, with these uh, cheap webcams being one example. So thank you for listening. Um, any questions? Yes. Um, I was listening to some information about the drones and how that the space between the 85 foot above your home and all that space that property is above your home. Right. Then the, uh, the FAA owns 500 feet and above. Where do the UAVs fly? UAVs, to fly a UAV, you need to have a, what's called a COA, which is a cooperative um, agreement with the FEA. You can't just fly a drone. You have to have an agreement with the FEA. If the agreement is not accepted, you can't fly. So um, there are circumstances if, if there is um, information put out by the FEA to say that no aircraft can fly in the area, then you can discuss with the FEA if you can get other equipment in there. But for a project that I'm applying to work on, I've, I've had to put in the ability to put in to apply for these agreements. If you don't have the agreement, you can't fly. So it's, a lot of it is working with the FAA of what's safe with the, to, to fly. And if the FAA agree that you as an, a, a UAV operator or company can fly, then, then, then but it would be in that space that the FAA controls. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's all working with the FAA to ensure that it's, that it's all safe. Yes, I know that. Uh, could you real time show us uh, some of these tools with the active activity down the chain right now? Down in Pavlov? Yes. Let's see if I can connect to the internet. See if I'm in. Looks like it. Nope. Okay. It does require an internet connection first. <laughs> okay. I'll just go into this one because it's quicker. So I don't have to. Okay. I'm in. So what I'll pull up just just for speed 
So what I'll pull up just to speed is the um, webcam from Pavlov. So the, this is the FAA um, webcam. Um, so what this is going to be is this is um, going to zoom in on to Cold Bay um, Airport uh, where the FAA have webcams pointed in multiple directions and I'm going to pull up the webcam that's pointed towards, so this is the webcam here, um, this is typical, this is uh, 1943 so this is 20 minutes ago, they update it every 10 minutes. Uh, this is looking out towards a couple of volcanoes, a couple of will be in here. Let's see if I can go back one step. Uh, north east loop. Let's see if there's been any. So this is um, more than just that recent snapshot. Um, it looks like it's been cloudy for the last few hours. So that's obviously. A limiting factor with some of these sensors is that you can be limited by weather. Um, and if you wanted to, so what I can do is I can then go to the observatory themselves. Uh, so these are all the volcanoes. I go to Pavlov. And then, by chance, I've gone to the Pavlov uh, seismic station and it looks like they're getting a data feed issue. So, looking at this, that the webcam's cloudy, you might have a data issue from the seismic data, you're then going to go, okay, maybe I should look at another set, type of data set. So you could look at satellite data. Um, and what I'm going to do is... I hadn't mentioned this in my presentation, I'm actually um, part of the university's first uh, startup company for volcanic hazard assessment. Um, and I'm going to show you some of our tools just because um, it's easy for me to get to. It's just grabbing the list of the last 24 hours worth of data for the region. And then hopefully I should be able to show you the most recent image that we have for that sector. Um, here we go. Okay. The most recent satellite image actually is from three hours ago. Um, because we don't have continuous coverage um, from satellite data. Um, I can put on the alert volcano. So there's this, this is so you can see again what we thought of, what we saw from the webcam was that it was cloudy. Um, but let's go back a few images and pull up something where um, actually it looks like. So it looks like even though it is cloudy. Um, there is some activity at the volcano. You can see this white spot here. I'll pull up. So this is now zoomed in around the volcano. So you can see, as I expected, it's cloudy. And this is going back. And there we go. So now, tune on this little cloud free. Here we go. So this is from earlier today. This is from uh, 3 p.m. Uh, so that's from last night. This is from 3 p.m. Um, Alaska time, um, 3 p.m. UTC. So this is 6 p.m. last night. But what you're actually seeing here is that the sensor can't measure any more thermal signal. It's actually telling us that there are six pixels, so six square kilometers, being raised to 65 degrees. 
that's the maximum that the sensor can measure for that area. Um, and um, so that actually it's th it, the, the system is, thinks that there's uh, two, four, six, eight, ten, two, four, six, 14 pixels that are elevated above the background. So this is an example of a tool that, and as you can see, this is all web-based. Um, I've just pulled up on my computer. But um, there is always a limit with some of these data sets that's it's, it's temporal, how often do you get them? But by bringing them all together, you can better understand the volcano. So a lot of these are, are, are being designed to be on the web to, um, meet, to make it such that I can do things like this, that if it wasn't a hazard, that you can bring it up without having to walk over to the institute or where the computers are based to access the data. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. I was going to ask you about the UAVs. I know yeah. you would like to use more of them in your research. It's coming eventually. We'll get there. Um, do you anticipate these will be your own, or will there be a private contractor? I imagine there's there's a great variety of these drone aircraft, right. and it depends on the sensor loads. And Correct. I can just see that it's undetermined that you know. How you're going to do this? Yeah. I wonder if you have a strategy for it. Yeah, that. I have. Um, the institute itself has a quasi, which is the Alaska Center for Unmanned Aerial Vehicle System Integration. And they have a suite of UAVs. Um, one of them actually can carry a thermal camera right now, um, but it's uncalibrated and they've been using it for fire, fire mapping for working with the incident command and the fire service. Um, and they've also got a hexacopter, which is a four-winged uh, aircraft that can take a heavier weight. Um, the current UAV that they've got can take a camera probably the size of my fist, but the ones we're thinking of are cameras about this long, the size of the microphone, um, which will be a, just like this one, but you don't have this extra contraption. You just have the actual lens. I suppose you'd like a standoff capability for like 20 hours. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. a much bigger aircraft. Yeah, so, but these 20, something that can fly for 20 hours, you're talking being half the size of this desk. But if I'm talking about something that's for 20 minutes, that you can get to a site, you've got line of sight to your active volcano, fly over there, map it, bring it back. Well, I think the next generation of this, uh, scientists will have a lot of interesting yes. tools to work with. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's making available as many data sets. Sure. UEV is just being one. Uh, webcams, you don't have to have a $20,000 camera lost. Um, still making use of helicopter flight, still making use of the person with the camera flying over the volcano because they can interpret things and determine which is the best data set to collect. If you go into Russia or Chile, don't they, they have their own F, you know, FFA? Or Correct, FFA. they have their own a a aviation. And to, to, to do that sort of work with the UAV requires a lot more documentation to be filled to be able to do that sort of research. You're welcome. Yes. In '89, when the K-Line flight basically flew right into the ash cloud, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of advances have there been for onboard aircraft detection for uh, ash cloud, or is there anything? This, it's, it, there has been some recent developments. Uh, there's a group in Europe um, developing a thermal camera that can be placed on an aircraft, so it can give you a forward view of what's coming. Um, there is no sampler on the aircraft for actually detecting ash. And I'm actually part of a, a small business grant with the Air Force to develop an ash sampler that could go on to, mainly for the military, but could be developed into the commercial sector. Um, but it's, there's, there's, in terms of the aviation community, a lot of what they did after the KLM encounter was to make sure no aircraft got anywhere near the planet. And now, they're, because of the activity in Iceland where the blanket ban was considerable, but now wanting to push a little bit more the boundary of how close I can get to an ash cloud. So there's now been a development into sensors that can't, that don't sample the ash cloud because that means putting the aircraft in the cloud, but better tells, gives you a piece of information in advance. So you're, you're pointing where the aircraft is going to say, is there something ahead, just like a weather radar, just like we're having a cockpit for knowing what the weather clouds are. You can say if that's a weather cloud or is it an ash cloud. And then the pilot can relay that information to ground control to determine which route is then safe for them to fly. So currently the onboard weather radar is uh, unable to discriminate between precipitation and volcanic ash. Correct, because it's just a radar signal, whereas you would need infrared to see the difference. And I know it's been worked on, but I don't know how far away. It's a colleague of mine in Europe that's doing it. 
Yes, sir. I'm kind of fascinated by that idea that there might be a thermal signature to an ash cloud you know, at 30,000 feet that, uh, if, if an airline uh, 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 ability to look ahead in terms of the thermal signature, if the, at what point does that thermal signature uh, be basically ambient and so no, no signature? I'm, I'm amazed that there would still be a thermal signature uh, you know, miles or many miles. How many? Good question. I'm exactly the same feeling. And I, don't, I, 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 I see the same as well. I'm not developing the camera, but I see a problem with the camera. But the atmosphere, that at 30,000 feet, even though it's thinner, at ground level, that camera can probably see four or five kilometers. If you go 10 kilometers away, you then can't really see it. The atmosphere absorbs the signal. Even if there's an erupting cloud, you just can't physically see it because you're so far away that you're measuring the thermal signal of the atmosphere, not the actual erupting volcano. Um, so you would need to be pretty close to, for the camera to really work. The other problem with a camera that points directly ahead is you, you're not measuring the thermal signal of the, bulk, of the, of the ash cloud. You're measuring the thermal signal of the Earth through the cloud. So if you think you're at 30,000 feet, you're pointing along the limb of the planet, which means you're going to have less and less atmospheric heat that's going to be emanating through the cloud. So you're probably going to be pointing down at some point. You're not going to be probably pointing straight ahead. Um, so you're probably going to have to be pretty close, probably within, probably up there, maybe 10, 15 kilometers, maybe. Um, and also, you're going to be wanting to be above it. Maybe the better scenario is to point out to site, rather than pointing ahead, because you don't, that, that means you're still heading towards it. Towards it. Um, and also, you've got more atmospheric, uh, or more uh, heat coming from the ground that allows you to measure it. But the big problem is, to properly do it, you have to be pretty close. You, you, you can't be 100 kilometers away, you're just not gonna see it. Um, you're gonna, you could probably gonna have to be within 10 kilometers, and given the speed of an aircraft, it's taken longer for me to explain it than it would have been to fly to where the cloud was. <laughs> so it, it will be something that, it will be a last last scenario. That, oh, you're flying past the volcano, it's just gone off. Okay, I'm gonna veer out of the way. Not, oh, can I fly to, five kilometers to the right or five kilometers to the left because you're going to be within five or ten kilometers. Of it. So it's going to be an early detection of this event, just like a thunderstorm occurring, something like that, that you might see in the weather radar. It's going to be a short, short distance. But yes, that's that's a big question of the community is how far can it can it physically see? Yes? The summer of ninety two, I was flying in a Mark airplane from Kodiak to Anchorage mm -hmm. when Mount Spur went off. The pilot, it was just right there, it was on our left. Mm -hmm. And the pilot said, look, there she goes, there she goes. Yeah. We were the last plane to land for two days in yeah. Anchorage. Yeah, that, the um, <laughs> pilots will, will um, steer clear of any volcanic ash, but they will also, they also admire the explosivity of a volcanic eruption. And a lot of the times when an uh, aircraft goes up, it will, it will make its decision based on the advice. So, in 1992, the advisory centre was three years old at the time in Anchorage. So the observatory would have picked up the event. So he, that, that would have been probably first or the second piece of information that the observatory or the advisory centre would have got. And what's called a pilot report. It's called a pirate. Um, that says volcanic ash cloud to our left, bearing whatever below us or above us. And then he knows or she knows the flight altitude so you can work out the height. And that information would have been relayed to the ground station in Anchorage that would have gone, would have been another piece of information of what the type of event is, because unless it's an observation from space or the ground, seismic data can't always tell us the height of the cloud. But a pilot nearby can say, it's below me. And if he's at 30,000 feet, well, it's not reached 30,000 feet, and that's a useful piece of information. So that sort of information would have been a, one of, another piece of data to pinpoint the eruption. But that probably would have been June of 92, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. June the 26th. Right. You can see I've got a good memory for dates. I have <laughs> <laughs> June the 26th, then it was August 19th and September 17th. So, and I was 16 living in the UK, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Again, quickly, the simulation again, again of the KLM flight. Mm -hmm. Was there uh, normal atmospheric clouds that weren't affected? 
Um, yeah, the, there was actually an aircraft that landed a few hours earlier into Anchorage Airport. Um, but they knew, if you see the, uh, the text, they knew there was an eruption. She said, yes, it could be, a little, it could be an ash cloud. It's a little browner than the normal cloud. So she was making the assessment that it wasn't volcanic ash, but it could be. And she decided, and at the time, the policy was to go above it. Um, like you might do if you're going over turbulence or over a weather cloud, you want to get above it and away from the turbulent effect. So they rev the engines. Um, and if you rev your engines and try and go to 38,000 feet, most aircraft engines are hotter than the melting temperature of ash. So the aircraft ingested ash, went in, it melted, and through the combustion pot, went to the back, cooled, solidified, and went <laughs> and just took out the air intake. Um, the policy now has changed. The policy is to, if you, if you see an ash cloud, is to turn and bank at safety to the passengers and go back from where you came. Because the main thing is, is the ash cloud is in front of me, it's not behind me. So the policy has changed as a result of these events, of not to treat it like a weather cloud, to treat it as a, as a, as a specific hazard. Um, but the, the, um, in terms of the eruption, the view that I showed you is fairly dramatic, but I've analysed the event and the aircraft only clipped the edge of the cloud. It was right on the edge. Um, some of the simulations, I've even struggled to get the aircraft and the cloud to latch. It was that close to the edge of the cloud. But there were weather clouds as well. Uh, I don't know if there were weather clouds nearby, but uh, the pilot was making a decision, to, or the co-pilot was making the decision to land because an aircraft a few hours earlier had gone in. And the, the cloud was... There was an event going on, the cloud was dispersing, but I think um, it dispersed quicker than what they were expecting. So the, the aircraft was coming into land and was just coming into land, and it, the cloud was coming to it too quick. Okay, I think that's it for questions, because then everybody can get out. Thank you very much. Reminder, the Red Hackle Band will be playing tomorrow at the Botanical Garden. If you're interested in tickets, I'll be selling them outside, or you can get them at our office or online. And lastly, if you would like to get email updates, I will also be taking care of that, so come see me after your potty break, of course. And thank you all very much for coming tonight. Oh, uh, when the, does these satellites... The cat traveling overhead, there's thousands of volcanoes, I'd imagine, right. worldwide. Are they taking pictures all the time as a matter of course, or do you pick up a red phone and say, hey, I, <laughs> I need a picture of Pavlov uh, right it'd now? It'd be nice if we could do that. No, most, most of these are um, actually capturing data for more than just volcanoes. They're so they're just doing routine, routine scans. And then, and then some of them, um, some of these satellites will specifically, so some of them are capturing data all 24-7, all the time, and some of them based on their uh, duty cycle, their responsibility. If there's something of real interest, like a, a disaster or something like that, then they'll specifically capture that location over, the, over their normal routine. So, you can so there has to be a clearing house of people saying, yes. I have an important thing to yeah. do. Thank you very and much. So do you, as a volcano person, Not say, me specifically, I want you to get this picture, <laughs> yes. like a, an extra zoom at a certain angle? Yes, we do. Uh, there's, there's, there's a, a process There's that. a process. It's with NASA, so NASA is the one that controls the satellite sensor. But what we can do is we can task a satellite that says the next time you are close by, if you're directly overhead or west or east, point at this location, don't look at the area next to it. And then are there choices like frequency of the spectrum and filters and uh, all these other camera type parameters yeah. that you would want to specify? Yeah, well, the, the camera on these satellites is already specific, specified, but it captures over a very broad range. So it's visible and it's infrared across a very broad infrared range. So we would get, for that one, we would get imagery at 20 different wavelengths captured in from one event. And, and generally, if we get put one of those tasks in, we'd probably get it within two or three days. Okay. So, so, but some of them, like the weather satellites, are just always capturing data, and then they just make use of those for walking in. I uh, just retired from the FAA, and I spent 
20 years putting those cameras in. So okay. I think it's oh, cool. fun that you're using them. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're great use because, in, especially in Alaska, a lot of them are actually pointed at volcanoes. Like some of our huts uh, have some of the volcano observatory instruments. We've mm -hmm. leased them a rack space. Right. Or the other way around. Sometimes we lease yeah. rack space from other folks. Yeah, exactly. To yeah, put in our equipment. Yeah, you, you're 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 doing what you're making use of multiple multiple data sets in one location. You know, they they now have a whole list of parameters on how to point those cameras. In the old days, we just pointed them where the guy on site thought was the most right. useful. Now yeah. we have all these parameters. Right. But if you know of a camera angle that's just missing something mm -hmm. of interest. Right. You might call them up and say, "Hey, can you go five degrees left? We'd right. like to see this volcano just yeah. out of view." Right. You know, mm -hmm. they might they might entertain that. Yeah. Especially <laughs> if it's safe for aviation safety. Sure. Which they generally are. Thanks for the uh, talk. You're welcome. Thank you. I want to say that was very very interesting. Good. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Good. Um, Hopefully, it was at the right level. Oh yes, and I think um, I was most pleased because I am a public information officer, so I interact with a lot of other public information officers at GI and IARC and IAB and all these. And a lot of times there's a conversation about how the scientists are not able to communicate with the public because they use a lot of jargon and there's this huge disconnect. And so it was amazing to hear that you were actually able to add humor and make it yeah. like to the level of a regular person who does not understand a lot of things and the fact that you mentioned that oh we can do this with a $44 camera you know so yeah. th that it is not out of reach yes. or is above everybody's mental level yeah. um, so I think that was great and I really wanted to appreciate yeah that's it's, it's, time to do that yeah I've, I, I've presented to six-year-olds and I've presented to retired four-star generals Right. The same presentation, the same slides. Right. But it's to a six-year-old, you, you, you're not going to talk about twenty million dollar aircraft that are impacted. Oh, look at the erupting volcano! Look how red it is. Right, but and that's exactly what you're going to be doing on Monday when right. you know you're going to be talking about volcanoes again, yes. but a magical Monday. So. Yes. I think great. Thank cool. you very much. This is going to be recorded. Actually, I will share it with the GI folks right. um, so that they can share it through their networks because mm -hmm. this is probably valuable for their constituents and mm -hmm. share it too. Perfect. Okay. Great. Thank you Wonderful. Very much. You're welcome. Is there anything I can help you pack up or do anything? Nope. What I will do is hopefully this battery has not run out. Okay. Let's see how many. It's taken 443 photos. Sounds good. So I will make sure that we can get those to you guys as well. Oh, that would be great. That would be fantastic. So Thank you very much. It's taken infrared and visible at the same time. That would so be. We'll be able to animate it. Yeah, so we'll be able to put that on and share with people. <laughs> or maybe it'll just be still for an hour while I'm talking. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you once again. No problem. Have a good night. Yep, same to you. 445. 445. <laughs> so have you been to Rikard 201? Yes. Okay, so you know what the setup is like, and do you think that it's going to be okay uh, to use that room? Because some of the one of the things that we wanted to do with Magical Mondays was to have sort of a hands-on thing, and mm -hmm. because there are going to be kids involved right. uh, that have short attention span than adults, and you don't want to do things. So um, I'm not sure what you're planning on doing, uh, or is it going to be a presentation? Yeah, I, I, I've got a presentation that I've given. Um, I can also bring some more of our gear. I'll bring this camera with me. I can bring another one of these. Okay. I can bring some of the smaller webcams. I've got this, which is actually a, just an infrared temperature sensor camera. Also, the kids can probably you know, touch it. And I think that's what I just wanted to gauge, that if there's anything that we can provide or help you get organized, I will be there on Monday as well. OK. Um, and Gretchen, I don't know if you remember, Gretchen is the person who's coordinating everything right. from Magical Monday, so she'll be in touch as well. OK. But yeah, I, I can. I've got a presentation, and I, what I, was, I can also do is um, maybe I can pull together some real, some, like when that gentleman asked about, well, can you show me some data, is that we've actually got a page that's global, multiple webcams from all over the world of active volcanoes that I could go to, and, and hopefully there'll be some active activity in it. Oh, that would be great. So I can try and show those and, and uh, maybe bring some more videos and sounds. That would be perfect. Right. Okay, good. Thank you very much. You're welcome.